Starting Taste Buds is a show from a state of mind that samples those taste buds associated with Bonnie Scotland. I'm Paul John Dykes and this week I am joined by Brian McClear who regales us with stories about the late great Tommy Burns, the flamboyance of Eric Cantona and the genius of Sir Alex Ferguson. Will Chalky enjoy the Scottish cuisine? Let's join him on Tartan Taste Buds to find out. Uh, before we get into the first dish, what do you think of the uh, Rolling Stones-esque logo? I'm very impressed with it. It's, um, it's something that I used to draw. Not the tartan the one like that one, but something I used to draw because I've always loved the Rolling Stones. In fact, it was something I considered uh, as a tattoo until I uh, saw was a, a rugby player came and trained with us at, at Celtic for a couple of days and went as a Scottish international. And um, I noticed, it, which I thought was a bit of dirt just on his leg. And I was about to say, excuse me, you've got a bit of... And then it, it was a little, little tiny Rolling Stones logo. Right. I thought, he's stolen it, can't, can't have that. And I've been... I've been uh, struggling to think of something to get a tattoo with ever since. Then. And you've never had one since? No, you've never, never had one at all. No. You've never done it? No. I'm the same. When you look at that though, it's meant to have the Scottish tinge. But I've got to say, in terms of the beard, Brian, it's not as impressive that's as the one you have on the screen. Very that's uh, I would like it to be that colour right enough rather than the colour that I've got. No, 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 I wouldn't actually. I'd like it mine to be a lot more silver. Maybe that'll shit. come eventually. Yeah, um, absolutely. That's part of the thing about uh, not being able to get anything cut and then just leaving it to see what happens as an experiment. My mother actually asked me if I was um, if I was considering auditioning for the part of Jesus Christ <laughs> when she saw me for the first time <laughs> a few weeks ago. It's a good look. It's a good look. I like the Peaky Blinders cap as well. Yeah, well, that's something that I had bought this even before Peaky Blinders became mm-hmm. made sort of mainstream. Were you a fan? Um, of, of Peaky Blinders or The Heart? Both. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think Peaky Blinders is a fine it's immense. program. Yeah. It's really yeah, good, isn't it? It's uh, well written, well acted. Um, having spent a, a year in Birmingham also and several other periods on holiday in my, as a child, the accents are very good. And difficult to pull off. No, not if you're there or not, really. Now, if you spend a year there and all that, I'm not going to have a go at that. Because you usually get, well, that's a Liverpool accent you're doing, or you can't even do a decent Scottish accent. Never mind, attempt to do a uh, black country. So. I love that Birmingham link, because that's obviously where your career started. But when we speak about football, we'll do it after we've given you something to eat, OK? Well, that's very, very kind of you. Let's break bread. I can really break bread. I know you like at least one of these. <laughs> <laughs> I actually like. Uh, well, yeah, well, I like them now. I liked them. You liked them back in the day, in your student days. Uh, yeah, snowballs would have been the in the student time. Oh, there would be three, wouldn't there? The camel log would also mm. have been in there. I think that's underrated. Well. One of the uh, collection. I was quite partial to that, you know, as well. Mm-hmm. I would like to mix up a bit, you know, when. When I was at uni or the, during the breaks in between lectures, go to the students' union uh, or even the refectory, I think, yeah, the refectory and have a, get a coffee and <laughs> either a snowball or a camel, or a camel log, log or a camel wafer, you know. Well, I think I maybe went more for the camel log, I think. You want to sample one right now? And uh, so, yeah, you'll show us what one you prefer. Yeah, good choice. Although I don't think they last long enough, Brian. I think that's the only. Well, they were. I know my criticism. hands have got bigger than they were when I was a child, but they're definitely smaller than they used to be. This leads us on, just as you 
indulge. Well, we should try this you enjoy. Yeah. You yeah. enjoy it. Oh, your nickname, Chalky. Yeah, it's not to do with this though. So uh, we all talk about your, your nickname because I, I've spoken to you before about that. Uh, six million of these bad boys sold every single week in Scotland, which is impressive. We must have a sweet tooth. Um, Chalky was nothing to do with you having a sweet tooth, though, was it? No. That was to do with Tommy Burns. Well, it wasn't Tommy Burns that came out with it. It was um, when I signed for Celtic in 1983. We went on pre-season tour to Switzerland. And we were playing a game against... Um, in those days, it was Baal. Like Basel. But then, for whatever reason it was, it was Baal. I might have been Basel then, but nobody told us it was Basel. So we're playing Baal. And it was a Saturday afternoon, and I, I tell you, it was bailing. It was clear blue sky, sun beating down, very, very warm. And they had, uh, very much like a lot of the stadiums of its time, a big support section behind, well, like the Celtic game, but with no, with no covering. And uh, as I said, you, the, it's very, I mean, really, really hot. It must be 90 in the, in the shade. It was that hot. And over the top of this steep, we could hear a couple of guys singing the um, Celtic song. And over the top of this bank, a huge, big, steep bank at the top, comes across two Celtic fans that had made their way somehow to Switzerland for this pre season game. And they are got top to toe, green and white on. They've got woolly hats on, they've got scarves on. I think they maybe had the shirt on with the sleeves rolled up. Long trousers, gutties, training shoes. Green gazelles. But probably, yeah. Good chance of that. I didn't quite notice that. And one of them shouts, but see, you could see him cupping his hand. On you go, the chocolate McClare. And I just sort of that's gave a wee wave. Tommy Bond stops and I goes, right, what was that? Chocolate, right, chocolate, right, chocolate. You're having it. And I was like, what are you on about? That's your name. You're, we'll go, you're having chocolate. He just kept, because he thought that I didn't like it. And that was part of the thing about people getting called names that they didn't like. There's all that they wind you up or irritate you. Or so that he could have his own entertainment out of. And uh, he just kept calling me that all the time. All the time. Not like just, just you know, when normal conversation, you'd be having coffee, he would use, he had chocolate and all chocolate. Have was cho chocolate we having? You haven't said, what's your favourite film chocolate, you know? You haven't said, is there that soup like chocolate? You know, what's that water like? You know? Is that a nice beer chocolate? So, from that was, and that was it. To and, this then, uh, and then it got shortened to, uh, to uh, Chalky. I, yeah, but I think it's a, it's a great name for me because it's pretty unique. Uh, and that, that when people talk about me in terms of football terms, they know it, it's, that it's me, you know. Um, I haven't quite got to the situation now where I sign that as my name. I've actually added it a few times to the middle of it. Uh, but And then I've, I've during years and years and times of, of, I suppose it's a bit like uh, modern modern writing, letter writing into when you do messages on things, mm -hmm. social media or whatever. And if I'm if I'm replying to somebody who's taking the time out to to uh, ask me a question, particularly on um, uh, Twitter, when I'm replying back to them, I always sign it as if I would be signing a letter. And, um, I, I've st I, and then with some friends, I started to change it just because when you see... Um, particularly South Americans are maybe more pertinent than the, uh, than the you know, you, if you look at the most famous one, you've got Edson Arantes de Nascimento, and that's Pele. I used to quite like, and I love Socrates. I think that, you know, just love him as a player and as a character that uh, played for Brazil. Um, and I just started to change my name to name to different things, Chocese, Chocrates, whatever things I saw, <laughs> you know, that I thought would be a, you know, any kind of chalk out, chalk Ronaldo, chalk Ronaldo, that sort of thing, you know, any. Chocolatees is a cracker. But then I thought I'd just stuck with kind of chocolatees a bit there, you know, which is a pretty pretentious, really. <laughs> but most of the things that I do weren't pretentious, but yeah, and I, I quite like that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, there's been, it says it, I must admit, go, give credit to Tommy Burns for, for making that. I never had a nickname before that. You and know, every time you tell the story, you speak about Tommy, which is a good thing. 
We remember Aye, Tommy well, Burns. Yeah, he was a great influence and certainly at the time that I was there, you know, Tommy was 27 when I would be 19, you know, and uh, great influence, always positive, um, all, always encouraging, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, one of the, the nicest things that I've I've ever come across of a comment, if it was indeed a comment, about me as a football player that uh, Tommy was allegedly said that that uh, I think that Douglas and me were the two best players he'd played with, which for maybe Celtic player, I'm not quite sure, and I thought, mm, I'm not sure if he's still taking the piss out of me or not, you know, by mentioning that, you know, but I'll take it as something that was positive, you know. Absolutely. And I mean, funny, he was, and he was funny. I mean, he, he, I don't know whether it's to do with um, the colour of your hair, but in my, my football career, Tommy and uh, Gordon Strachan were two of the funniest, if not the two funniest, humorous footballers of all. And quick, you know. Imagine like that kind of thing, together. picking up on that. Oh, well, there's a, there's Celtic. a, there's a story that, uh, about when they were two together at Celtic where that, uh, Gordon's a manager and Tommy's, uh, is, I don't know what position, was he assistant? Was he was, first, team was coach coach, yeah. first team coach. He was first team coach, isn't he? And uh, Gordon's at Celtic Park and he's standing at the halfway line just outside of the dugout uh, and it's not going quite so well for, for this team, for the Celtic team in that day. And Gordon's one thinking about where he could change it to to, to um, improve the performance, whatever. And there's a few cheers and a few different things. And he's always the same. It's very, very vociferous that bit. The people that sit behind that, because I remember in my time when I was playing, and sometimes when I was so, how, how the noise that a few people can make, and you can hear everything they're saying, particularly when it's negative. So Gordon's getting the pelters. And, and Tommy used to stand at the other side, I think, really, to be saying, well, I'm, I'm not the manager anymore, I'm just part of the, the furniture, really. I'm a bit of the wallpaper here, but I'm, I'm here at the end. As, and I'm leaning on the, he's leaning on the dugout at the end. So he's gone, getting pellers. Crowd are getting uh, agitated. The team's not performing like Gons one. He's, he's thinking about what it was. And he catches Tommy Bonds out the corner of his eye, slowly walking down. I thought it's all good. Tommy's coming down to give me a hand here because he'd been in this situation before many times, and that might be a wee bit different from his view. Maybe a little bit different what I'm thinking about, or maybe what Gary sent to me, his assistant. Oh, it's good he's coming. That's but it's good that really, he's coming down. He's walking down to me, and I'm just I'm standing there and I'm waiting for him just for his um, words of wisdom that's going to help us uh, win this game of football. And he stands beside me and he cups his hand over his mouth and he goes, I know where the trap door is. And then walked away. And everybody watching thinks he's just offered some words of wisdom. God, like that. How can I, how am I not supposed to? God wants to laugh. This is a serious situation with regards to what's happening on the pitch. And he's just like, what's he supposed to do with that? He just wanders away, chuckling away at himself, is he? Take returns to the other end of the dugout, but that stuff's priceless, isn't it? Dearly missed. You mentioned about being a sub. One thing I always look at is the 1985 Scottish Cup final, 100th Scottish Cup final. Yeah. And you're on the bench, you come on, obviously you make an impact, Brian, but why didn't you start that again? you have to ask David Hay that. It's bizarre, eh? It's bizarre. Now, I know Celtic had a great forward line, great forwards. But surely the man who was a top goal scorer for four seasons that you were at Parkhead. Ah, well, I used to get left out all the time, so it wasn't really that much of a surprise to me, you know. So um, it's more about the, you know, you, you just have to, things like that happen and to be part of it, you're still a part of it. And then I come on and we, we, we would struggled. Um, Dundee United were a fine side at that time. And they were controlling the game and they were winning the game. And we probably we probably stole that thing really in terms of of the game, but goals change games, and and Davies and Frank's goals are the ones that they end up um, winning the trophy for. So it's kind of dramatic things, aren't they? I mean, they're really mm -hmm. dramatic that, and also the other, the winning situation for me. But it's the tough kind of thing. You just asked that question because I had a dream last night about about uh, being 
part of in a Cel in a Celtic dress room playing a game at Celtic Park. And David Hayes, a manager, and I've gone to speak to a couple of friends that I've not seen. This morning, something to do with being locked up for so long, but a couple of friends I've not seen for a while. And, with, and I go back towards the dressing room and he's pointing to his watch and he comes over. And I go, oh, I'm sorry, I got a bit carried away and lost track of time. And they come in and they tell, he, he tell me, I'm not I'm right, that's fine. Okay, I apologise to the rest of the players. And then, and then he tells me, yeah, you're not playing. That was last night. Just last night? Right. Is it because this was on your mind no, and you knew I was going to ask you about Derry? No, I do with this at all. It's just, it's just I've started myself when I woke up, so that's pretty bizarre, you know. And then it was, you know, it's bad enough dreaming about Alex Ferguson all the time now, dreaming about David Hay, you know. Creeping into your dreams. But you did have a f tremendous performance, Love Street 86. Every time I think about that, Brian, it's an iconic day. The strips, the result. The hairstyles, everything about that day. <laughs> what sure do you was, remember about it? I'm not sure it was a hairstyle I had, but that was another. It was a, and that was another thing that just reminds me again of Tommy Bonds because I got, I had this strange idea that I would, I, I actually went to get my hair as a, in that time, I tried the Demi Wave thing. And I don't know if the guy's just taking the piss or not, but he, he permed my hair. And I was just was like horrified when I got warm and all that kind of thing. I tried to get it off. Nowadays you'd be able to use straighteners or whatever else and various different hair products to get it straight, but it just got kind of sprung back into this thing. And Tommy Burns was ripping the piss out of me right for all that time. I just, oh, I just, I need to just, I can't, unless I get a, a skin hair that I'm number one, I'm just going to have to endure this. So I just let it grow. And uh, I just let it grow. And that glow, as it got through into the summer months, been quite long. It started to get lighter, as well. I don't know if it's because of the, I don't know if it's because of the shit I had in my hair as well as the sun, <laughs> which might have been sun or might not have been. And when it got longer, I, Tommy Bonds would come into the dressing room and, he, and I used to sit in this little corner here, and there was a, a wall here, and the door was at the other side of the wall. And Tommy would come in and he'd, he'd turn around the corner and they'd go, Rah! and then go and sit down. <laughs> It, that was every day for that, that period of time. So, uh, yeah, the hairstyle, the the game. Well, for me, it started weeks before that because we got to a situation where we had to win. We had to win every game, mm -hmm. and we started off on that run. And when we went to Petardry and beat Aberdeen one 0 I think we felt that we've got a very good chance of, of actually pulling this off now because we never won it. Not in a not in the league anyway. Mm. We never won it, Pedodri. I don't think I have never won there in the league. So I think there's a real lift from, from winning that game. Because again they were a very good team. And had a, a wonderful home record. A good win uh one nil and then we went on to get to the situation where it's the last day of the season. Uh, we've got St Man. We know what we have to do. We have to win by two clear goals. And we know that the Hearts have to lose. Or the other way around, Dundee have to win against mm -hmm. us. What not a lot of people might not realise is that the Dundee team, who were managed by Archie Knox, had the chance that year of qualifying for Europe. So there was something in it. And yeah. for them as well so there was no like dead rubber for them and uh, contrary to what people might say about uh, St Mirren they, did, they, they didn't capitulate before the game started we had one of the finest performances that I've ever been involved in particularly in that first 35 minutes including mm -hmm. one of the best goals that I've ever been involved in uh, as, a, as a start to finish situation when we got to to, uh, to the point where we're, well, you're five nil up, you know that that you've, we've done what we need to do, and we've got to be reliant on on what happens elsewhere. And then in those days, people would have your transistor, oh, your tranny transistor radio, little, all holding it to mm -hmm. their ears. You know, mm -hmm. not everyone, but it's, well, people been crowded around other people to listen to what was occurring. Um, on, uh, in the game at uh, at Dens Park, which both games were back and forward, 
between um, Dance Park and Dun and, and uh, Love Street. And uh, there was a dampening kind of thing because it came over that the kid had scored. So most people thought that that uh, the kid of hearts had scored. Mm -hmm. And then it, it very quickly, because you did some of it, I don't know, I know Hugh Keevans was doing one of the games, I don't know if he was at Love Street or he was at and Jimmy Sanderson would have been doing the, the other stuff as well. Check Young, maybe. And uh, there was a thing we were about it. It's uh, Albert Kids scored, and so there was a. And the strange thing about that was that because it was. Um, Jim Stewart was in goals that day for, for something, and Campbell Money had was poorly before the game. So Jim Stewart, ex Rangers goalkeepers in Scotland and Rangers. And uh, he's got the ball in his hands. He's mm -hmm. got actually got the ball in his hands when everybody. He's just like. He's looking at his face, was like. An incredible thing, and then um, you're getting the flag because their game was was going on, and then they've got a blow again that uh, uh, our kids scored a second goal, and then there's that little delay because their game finished after ours. But when they're two, you're two nil up, one nil, you're that little period of thing, you're thinking, oh, hearts because they've been so effective all year. They, they scored lots of goals, played some great strong football. side. Strong, strong side. Would 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 get a chance or something like that. John Roberts and Sandy Clark, John Cohen, and uh, but they, they, they didn't quite make it, um, and we ended up as as, as champions, uh, which is a great to be champions. Winning things is what one of the reasons why I want to be a professional football player. Winning in those circumstances probably make it even more special. It's such a great memory for all the people who who were there. Mm. And there was. 239,000 at the game. And, and rising. And rising. Yeah. Francis McGarvey, your old strike partner, he told me that uh, because the sub goalie didn't expect to play, he'd eaten two of the pies <laughs> that had been sitting in the dressing room. Uh, so not the perfect pre-match. What kind of pre-match meal would you have normally had, Brian? Would it have been something sweet? Sugar-filled? No. no. Pre-match I used to have, uh, certainly the home games, um, I would uh, yeah, set in the home games from the home games pre-match for me was a uh, triple decker uh, bacon and egg sandwich with tomato sauce and a cup of coffee pre-match that would be uh, about you're supposed to you talk about eating three hours before maybe get away with two hours before carbohydrates and things like that oh, so if you look at it, it was, I had some carbohydrate in the in the bread Maybe a bit of sugar and stuff in the tomato sauce. Um, the rest of it, I'm not quite sure about. But a bit of protein in the egg. And uh, but that would have been so we'd we had to report. We had to be in the ground for for three o'clock kick. We'd be there for quarter to two. Mm -hmm. So that would have been like one o'clock. So I'm right on the border of what you're supposed to be eating. Then. Triple decker, bacon and egg sandwich. Didn't do you in arm, right? No. No, not at all, yeah. But uh, I don't think it, on the day of the game what you actually eat, it's not that, it's about all the preparation you do mm. um, and stuff that you do the night before. Make sure you get rest, make sure you're, you're free feeling, as they call it now. Aye. Plenty of carbohydrates the night before. So I don't think, I mean, if you watch the game and how, and how well Celtic played that day, and the goals that were scored, I don't mean, you could stick that Jim was culpable for any of the goals at all. They were all. So he, he could have had no pies or he could have had another dozen we pies. We can't blame the pies. I don't think it would have been. Can't blame the pies, no. <laughs> and I said that, that he, people suggested that all the rest of the St. Lynn players had had plenty of pies as well, but they tried hard that day. They just, we were. Uh, uh, we were top form. Magnificent. Top form. I mean, that goal you, you describe, McGrain, McStay, McClare, it was just one of the finest goals. Yeah, it was. Just and a I, shame I you didn't finish it. Part of it. Well, I couldn't cross it and run in at the same time, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> I, thought I scored the first one and the last one or the fourth one. I was, anyway, I was more than happy with my contribution. But when you're running through like that kind of thing, and it's a wee bit like the goal that got scored uh, um, the... By um, well, the own goal went that ended up again for the um, Slovakia. Went to, my little nutmeg and went away. I, I wasn't blessed with great pace when I'm running towards someone. It's the only way that I'm going to be able to get past them was or, or get to the situation where I wanted to get to was a nutmeg, and I just managed to get 
he came and defended and, and uh, tried to win the ball and I managed to get the ball through and, and get to the point where he can just and then when you get to that point all you want to do is, is really hit it low and hard across the goals and you may end up having an own goal like uh, I think one of the games the other night was the Italy, Italy game I think you know defenders on towards their own goals but it was a, it was a tap in but I think the whole event was that great play from Danny wonderful mm. from, from the heart to suit me not Megan and, and it's, a, it's a good cross I mean, a nice well, a nice pass well cross whatever and uh, it's in the back of the net there's another nickname the hat and I think that came from Tommy as well I didn't I don't know that. well there was two parts to the hat you because it was the hat and it was then Le Chapeau which is the hat in French you know <laughs> so I think the Le Chapeau was Tommy <laughs> I think Tommy Burns called Paul Le Chapeau. Is that because he, he used to speak French when he had a few sherbets? Tommy or? Paul? No, I think it was because his hair looked, his head looked like a hat, didn't it? So <laughs> that made the thing, it looked like a, his hair looked like a hat. Brilliant. It didn't, never move, I think that was, well, that may have been Tommy, I don't know, that could have been his brother. Because his brother called him that as well, they couldn't call him Paul. And there's like Le Chapeau, which is, I just thought that was wonderful. Another great, he's another great nickname, and Tim, I just wonder. So, and everybody knows, again, the same kind of thing. There's no misunderstanding about balls come from a, from a, a family that have, have represented Celtic in various different forms, you know. But he's the hat. He's the hat. How good was he, Brian? Could, oh, he, could he have played in any company? Aye. Yeah, I think he could have. He was a wonderful football player, great temperament. And considering that he had exercise induced asthma, he did ever so well. I was like, exercise? How can you have exercise induced asthma? He had to take his puffer before the game. Strange that, you know, an athlete. Wow. I, I developed, he developed exercise induced asthma at, when I was at Celtic in 84, 85, something like that. That's and he could take long to, to, to play at such a, a top level. He's a great football player. I, I'm a, a cracking lad. Mm -hmm. Right, the maestro, the maestro. You ready for another dish? Yes, indeed. I thought that was it. Let's do it. I thought that was it. For the big review. Big review. We're playing it safe. First couple of dishes safe. are safe. It is what it looks like. What tizer? And um, I can smell it from here. I'm brewing it. Is it amber? It is. Is it the proper air brewers that I R O N that you used to get from the lorry outside the, the, the bars? House it's a bars gear made from girders. What was that called? That. In Dunfermline, it was Woodrose that did the juice. Yes. I remember it was Alpine. Alpine. Bon Accord. Maybe Alpine. Just mm -hmm. come round in, the, in uh, the Monklands. But that's the real deal. Is it? Oh, is this original? It's the real deal. Original? Mm. Oh, wow. And out of a bottle. I don't know if that makes any difference to oh, the taste. Oh, yeah. Usually when I was thinking out of a bottle, there was saliva in it as well, because I used to share it. <laughs> I don't remember always getting the first slug out of it. Brilliant. Is it a hangover cure, Brian? Yeah. Why? No idea. Maybe it's a psychological it thing. It may be. But it does work. Mm -hmm. Definitely gives you a wee jag, yeah. It's, yeah. A, it's definitely something that... The other one that I uh, found out was the Ascot powders. When they were illegal, there was something in them. It was some kind of amphetamine that was in it. Instantly cured your hangover, but they had to take it off the shelves. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Ascot powders, and I think I've got Ascot fights and miseries. Yeah, but that would have been administered as as a cold remedy, wouldn't it? Mm, yep. I don't remember. Um, I, I can't say for sure that. I'm, 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 I know that. Well, I'm aware that people would have taken that as a on a Sunday Maybe morning. Yeah. Sprinkled it in the iron brew. Yeah. So, what's the secret recipe? Did you exactly? 
if you were to describe this to our many um, viewers on an international basis, how do you describe Iron Brew? What is it? It's, well, it's tasted all sorts of things all over the world. I would say that this is very, a very unique flavour. One of the most, one of the things that hits you right away is that how bubbly it is, mm. how effervescent it is. Um, particularly if you're slugging it out of a bottle, you know. Uh, it can lead to a bit of um, reflux and choking. I've had in my, as I say, that um, I'm, I think that my choice is, is I move a bit of saliva in it, not necessarily mine. Watered down by saliva. You know, somebody else's, <laughs> but you know, that was normal then, wasn't it? You couldn't afford, you know, when you were doing playing the football in the park or golf in the park, and you, you'd had maybe enough money to get a bottle between you, and uh, and if you then and left, you'd toss your coin to get the first slug, and after the, the first slug, you even didn't, you didn't want the last slug, you know, that was a, and if there's more than one of you, you know, you you just go home there, you know, so. There's a gingery element, a ginger beer kind of element there to the back of your harsh, throat, isn't there? I kind of have, mm. it's very, I can see that uh, it's, a, it's a drink that you'd have to um, endure with, but once you've you've got over the thing, you, it's it's wonderful. Why do we call it ginger in this country? Juice. Is there, I don't I can't give you the reason for that. Pop in England. I pop. Yeah. That. Even in Newcastle, they call it pop. But we'll go with ginger now. We've uh, already started talking about, uh, or we've touched on the fact. Like you can tell it's different. It um, is different. Eh? I quite. I have a lot of glass of um, amber extra now. You can, you can taste that. Remember the short-lived um, energy drink they did? <laughs> Tried to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Red Bull. I thought they were still doing that. Is that it? still out there? I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've, I've, I've never drunk Red Bull. I've never drunk that either. So it gives you wings. I don't want to have any wings. It's too late for me now. No, I know that um, Paul Gascoigne... Um, was was hammering down bottles of bottles, sorry, cans of, of Red Bull before he played a game for Middlesbrough when Brian Robson was the manager. And they must have had six or seven or eight. And it, is it is it full of caffeine? Red mm. Bull? Yep. So and uh, he went on they went on the pitch and he was like a, I think they described him as a like a um, a whirling top, you know, that toy, you press the button and it spins round. He said he was dude kicked off and he was way over there, and he was way over there, and he was way over there, and he's way over there, and way over there, and way over there. And he was everywhere for about 20 minutes. And I think Rob was at the side trying to shout on him and he just looked up and he had this mad stare in his eyes and this mad like kind of and sh shaking all over the place, shaking, proper shaking. And then uh, Rob Robert took him off because he was, he thought he's, he's going to get sent off in this game because he was so, whatever it was that was in, so. <laughs> Caffeine well, gas poisoning. We, we ate tins of It's uh, right ridiculous, oh, the amount, oh. yeah, that he just get, I don't, uh, I assume that they had it there as, as a little thing, something to give you a, a little boost. Although I've had it, there's, there's been something about caffeine and, and uh, being used with um, sports teams as a a way of, of increasing their um, ability to run about. Mm, and had I, I'm not sure if I had iron brew with my... Well, I iron brew sometimes with my, my bacon and egg sandwiches. Yeah, pre-match. It have happened that, yeah. It's bringing back the memories, Brian. You're... Um, and it's about... The bubbles seem to last longer. I know. As well. It's straight out of the bottle. Ah, and you're you're the first really consumer of said bottle. Ah, yes. I can see why people are paying. It's like, is it twice the price or something for a bottle of it? Or is it a fiver or something like that for a bottle? Ah. I can see why you. It was pay exchanging that. As hands. A, as I am, um, as I am, um, treat. Scotland's national. Drink. I think it was twenty pence. Oh, and you got money back, didn't you? You did, aye. It was 20 pence you got back, wasn't it? 20 pence you got back, yeah. So, Remember yeah. it well, clink, clink, here's the bottle tank, is what you used to hear. Used to go run around looking for them sometimes. <laughs> Hi, exactly. Scotland, your Scottish career. Um, everybody at the moment is talking about Scotland back 
in the finals of a major tournament, Brian. You played in 1992. 1990, was it a big disappointment for you? Yeah, you were, it was disappointing, yeah. aye. Um, didn't get involved in... Yeah, when, you know, for me, I'm walking to school as a 13, 14, 15 year old and I used to daydream. Um, the, the, there's people who have got degrees now in, in uh, professional sport who have, got, have given it a different name and they're, they're calling it visualisation so they seem to think that it's an, a wonderful thing if Wayne Reddy turns around and says he lies there in his bed in the night before the game finds out what kit he's going to wear and, they, and he falls asleep thinking about what, wearing the kit and what guy he's going to score a goal we did that forever in Scotland because there was not a lot really else to do you know so when you were walking to school in the rain and I was visualising well daydreaming that uh, you, you would do be a professional football player, mm-hmm. you know. And you wanted to play. For me, I wanted to play for Celtic. I wanted to play for Scotland, and also I, I, Manchester United was a team that I liked as a as a kid because you were allowed to have an English team as well. Uh, so they'd actually to realise that, and and you and because well, the first time I'd watched t- colour television was the nineteen seventy four World Cup. So I, from what I can remember, that yeah, the first time I actually sat down with somebody on a colour television. In Scotland, they're in a group that was full of colour, mm-hmm. you know, because we had Zaire and we had Brazil, and uh, just the whole thing was. So I, I would be nine, eight, nine, what was it, ten, I think, ten. Um, but that was part of the, your dream to play for play for Scotland, and I, and, I, and I did that many times. I was involved in loads of situations, but when you're involved in that, you just get the next. When you're involved all the way through. Uh, it's the last thing you expect not to be involved in the finals. Uh, but that happened to me. Um, but when I, when I reflect on it, it was probably something I did or didn't do. <clears throat> I don't blame um, Andy Roxburgh, who was a coach at the time. Because um, he, he, he decided he wanted to go with whatever group of players. Uh, I just had to accept that. At that moment, you're, you're, you're thinking, well, if I'm not going to the World Cup, then, then I won't play for Play for Scotland again, but I was I was involved in the post World Cup and uh, in the qualifying for for a major championship mm. in Sweden, uh, which at this time I went along to. So uh, I, I'm good. I'm glad that uh, when you, when I'm when I'm considering those kind of things and how you probably felt at that time to uh, to uh, spit your dummy out, I suppose, and just. Can't let really put his team and all that kind of thing. That I didn't, I didn't do that. Mm. I kind of mean, the, glad I maintained a kind of dignified silence about it. Because I think it benefited me. And Definitely. I'm not so sure it benefited Scotland, but it certainly benefited me because going to the Euros and playing the Euros, although we only managed to win one game, I think that the three performances were were really good. I don't, I don't think we were. I mean, we lost one 0 with a late goal. Mm-hmm. Against, a phenomenal uh, goal. Yeah, yeah, it was well against uh, the Dutch, bank. and then we played the unified Germany. So they they've gone from mm-hmm. having a, like a huge, yeah, but also a really a big population and great players to choose from to add in it. In fact, they're they're probably their best player in that team was was Samer, who came from the old East Germany, and uh, I think we played pretty well. We we lost that game, and we managed to beat the CES who were. Who were Russia included them? Um, who was my roommate at the time, Andrew Kincelskis. So it was it was a great tournament. We had, we, had, we had a really good spirit amongst all of us, having spent such a long time together. And I think we we we, we did pretty well. It's a great crop of players. When you look at you know the nineteen ninety, even the yeah. eighty six squad, the ninety squad, the ninety two squad, Brian. In terms of strikers that Scotland had at our disposal, it was quite frightening. Well, I yeah. <laughs> there was, huh? so, um, I didn't. I played in, in midfield in, in '82, so the the fact that I was um, adaptable, mm-hmm. I could play badly anywhere, <laughs> and I was quite happy to play badly anywhere. So. What was the selection in numbers? That was down to the number of caps. Right. So McStay was number three. I think. There was a little anomaly though. Yeah. I think there was. I think because it, it well, it's a little. I think the goalkeeper. I think. That um, <clears throat> I think um, for Alex Ferguson had done it in in uh, in oh eighty six I think maybe, maybe Andy did it in ninety 
But it was down to the number of caps you'd won. But there was a kind of anomaly, I think, between Paul and Richard Goff. Right. I think Richard Goff was adamant that he wanted two, because I think he was two for... Was it two for... Was it four? And whatever number he played for Rangers. Right. Two, I think. Is it always two? I know I played two for Dundee United because he started as a... He did start as a right back, didn't he? So I don't know yeah. where two... There was a bit in... About two and four, mm. maybe, about, maybe a little... <coughs> excuse me, this debate between them. And I don't think that, that, that Paul was that bothered, really, you know, so... The hat just took it. You mentioned Kinchelski, so your roommates. I always think, you know, when you're on tournaments like that or even away games, is there a lot of downtime, Brian, and do you get bored? How do you fill that time? Yeah, well, Pat and I... Uh, played a lot of Scrabble an awful lot of Scrabble and uh, and also at the time that we we had um, the Nintendo Game Boy had just come out right and uh, I had um, was very keen on um, video games I used to read video game magazines and I found out that you could get a cable that could that you could uh, marry up to to Game Boys as long as we had the same game so we both had the uh, uh, Nintendo Golf, which the, 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 the characters in it were, were Mario and Luigi, mm-hmm. and we played golf against each other as, as match play for hours. hours and days and weeks. Um, and so that's, that's one of the things that we, we did and talk nonsense to each other about life, universe, and everything, you know. So. Right, so who wins a game of Scrabble between Brian McClare and Pat Nell? Oh, I think a lot of the games were very close and highly contested. I think he probably made up more words than I did. Um, in part, part is more um, learned in uh, lexicography than I am. I'm more of a, a scientist and a mathematician. Uh, so I was it was mathematics you studied, wasn't it? Yeah, that was maths. That was mm-hmm. more. But again, if you look back on things and you ask anyone, it's all down to inspirational teaching and... Uh, Mine's was mainly mine, mine were mainly maths and science orientated. So, mm-hmm. so I think that's probably why I became pretty interested in, in those subjects. And leave the word smithery to Patrick Nevin. Yeah, I've always led it to the word smithery, as you say, <laughs> to Pat, yeah. Dish number three. Let's do this. Apprehensive, excited. Whoa. Oh, research. This looks like some more research to me. I think it's good for eating. Is it black pudding or is it haggis? I it is haggis. the haggis. And the first question I would ask, Brian, you're not vegetarian, are you? Nope. If you were to have haggis, would it be in chippy form or the, the traditional Rabbi Burns style? No, it would be in chippy form. Snap. No, I, I, I am partial to uh, haggis in many forms, sometimes vegetarian as well as uh, mm-hmm. as well as traditional. Uh, and once, I've never been to a uh, um, bun supper, but I have been to a Tommy bun supper. Oh, yes, brilliant. At so, Harriet Watt? Yeah, I went to the first one, which was a riot. Absolutely hilarious. Was Tommy there himself? He was there, yeah. Well, you can eat as much or as little of this as you I'm supposed desire. To be dignified and not use much. Just get wired in. And the other thing about haggis, I guess, is what's your take on that? Is it, is it nice? Mm. Mm-hmm. I thought you maybe managed to sneak in some kind of confectionery in the middle of that. No. I was expecting a wee bit of a. Um, <laughs> You've managed to get somebody to make, yeah, a deep fried haggis with some chocolate inside it. No, yet. Not traditional. Yet. We could ask for that, especially for chalky. Yeah. And just while you're indulging, um, we've touched on music a wee bit. I know you're a big fan 
of music. You were looking at our wall of vinyl earlier, Brian. You're drinking out a Roses mug. You're friendly with Manny of the Stone Roses, the legendary Manny. Is that a Pokes t-shirt? No, it is, Anne. Talk to us about your music. Eclectic? No. No? Everybody else might say that. For me, it's normal. Who am? People might say at times that I'm abnormal, but I think I'm normal and everybody else is abnormal. Um, it's quite a broad church when it comes to music, but mm. I always liked... I like guitar bands, I think, and, but I've always liked all sorts of different things. Um, when, I was, when I first started buying records, some of the time, because you didn't have the same information available to you now with regards to... You know, so I, as I said to you earlier, I was, you've got this little device in your house that you can shout at and it plays your songs. Mm -hmm. So you can hear things and, or you can, if you're watching a film and you hear a, a decent tune, you can do an app, you can use and it'll tell you what the song is and all that and then it'll take you straight It's too to, easy now. I know, it's a doddle. Mm -hmm. So when I saw a lot of times when I was going to buy things, not so much singles, but maybe albums, I would buy it because I liked the album cover. Mm -hmm. So that I was, you know, so I'll look at that and go, oh, okay, I'll try and read a wee bit about it. And you might have information in NME, different bands. So sometimes I would buy albums because I like to. So I've, I've got, um, I think it's called Stump by James on vinyl. That I bought because I like the album cover. That's been lost though, Brian, isn't it? That it's whole package thing where the art I'm reading it. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Oh. Lyrics inside, wow. Sometimes pictures inside or mm. posters. Mm -hmm. Well, I've done. But what, what records? What, what records? What, um, what record labels are on? Who else is on that? Uh, so I have uh, I've got the changes in different things. You go back to things. I've always liked music from the 60s, I think. But I love a lot of stuff from the 70s as well and some different genres. I don't know. I don't stick to the same thing, although I'm not, I can't kind of get into, I've tried to, you know, I made an effort to try and really listen to jazz, I can't quite get. Mm -hmm. Liam, my son's doing a podcast, so Drew's started to think about doing a podcast, and him and his mate will listen to Miles Davis. I know it's what, it's well, amazing stuff, and it's well, what they're doing is incredible, I, I just can't. It's not for you. Just can't get, just can't, can't get. I can't get it at the moment, you know. So, does your son get his love of music through yourself? Oh, he's, did he he's immerse right. himself in the tunes you were listening to as mm. he was growing up? He might have any choice. <laughs> when you're driving three and a half miles, three and a half hours, four hours from Manchester, depending on toilet stops, from Manchester, it's always Cheshire, back to the Monklands. You have to listen to what your parents are listening to. I haven't got. Their own little um, Walkmans and all that. There's no DVD things hanging on the back of the um, seats. Exactly. They could all just get hot wired into or iPads and all that. No choice. Does he thank you now though? Them. Because I, I mean, think they probably would. They I was, let's say the music line about the house. There's loads of CDs all and good. all that. Yeah. Mm. I wouldn't let them touch the vinyl. Couldn't trust them. But they could play the CDs and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think it. I think most people would be. Mine's is that we didn't really have we didn't have a record player for a long time, and then in the different ways it, it affects people. Um, I was I was with my my brother Paul the other day, who's four years younger than me. We used to share a room, and he hates some music because of of songs because I used to play them, and uh, in the uh, in the old uh, fashioned way of repeat. Well, you put a seven eight single on and you just you just go around to keep going up and back and start and start again. And being the oldest one he had no choice, but I had to get out of the room. It was very not want other place to go, particularly if it's raining. So he uh, and I don't even ask the question about it, I don't know why, because the one the song he's talking about is um I want you to want me by cheap trick. For some reason that's his on repeat all the time. Well, I have no idea why I bought it and why. I don't know whether if he even knew at the time that he hated it, maybe that was one of the ways I kept, I kept doing it, because you can be cruel to your siblings at times. But it, now it drives him to, he just like, can't it, listen. He had to just run. Aye, just run up and pick it off from where they heard it. 
I usually call on this one at the weekend. Yeah, big brothers. Music therapy, Brian. Well, I probably thought it was better than he hated it. Were you ever musical yourself? Your son plays the guitar, doesn't he? Yeah, because I think that in any kind of discipline that you do or you can do that people can do, there's a certain thing that you sometimes need to have which are put down to genetics. I don't believe in talent, I, I believe in hard work, mm -hmm. like what everybody does. So Liam, we, we, Liam was, we, we was interested because there was stuff in the house. There was a piano in the house. There was a keyboard in the house. And he started to, to, to mess about on, that, on, on himself. So we were in a position where the three of them, the two girls and him, were, were, were had the opportunity to, to, to try different things. They played badminton, they were badminton lessons, they were tennis lessons, they were horse riding. Lee made a couple of golf lessons, but they were bought as a present from someone else. They stick and all swim. The girls went to ballet and tap and things like that. And Liam, started just having this and started composing stuff on the piano on his own when he would be about 15, things like that. So then because he's interested in that, he gets a guitar and then he, he, he gets, he would take him to, to rock guitar lessons. So he's, he's, he's shown and he, he practiced, he worked hard to take practice, he practiced, he practiced and he kept still. The people are good at things, are good at it because of practice. Anybody that does anything will tell you that no matter what they do, whether they're a stand-up comedian, whether they're an opera singer, a football player, a tennis player, they'll tell you that they, that they practice more than actual performance mm -hmm. in order to, you know, to, to do what they're doing. So the best ones are the ones that have practiced the longest and most intense and listen to, to people who know at some particular points through their career the, who have had experience or good teachers. Uh, and then that's what it is. I never had to, I was I loved to, I'd love to have done it, but I didn't have to. I didn't. I didn't uh, uh, want to sit down and spend the time mm. learning how to play the guitar. Because you would want to do it well. And yeah, I'd want to do it well. And I want to do uh, And it does. It takes to get yeah. good. To get the good as end. It does take ten thousand hours. That's no question about that. It takes ten thousand hours. Mm -hmm. I had another ten thousand hours. I seen recently that. The bold Liam had uh, Eric Cantona, your ex-teammate, in one of his videos. Is that something you would consider, Brian? Would you be in a music video? Depends who it was. Liam? No. <laughs> Liam Gallagher? Yeah. No. no. I like to choose. I wouldn't choose Liam. I'll go, I'll be in Liam's. Good. I wouldn't be in Noles. Not Noles. You'll be able to tell me the facts. Um, Manchester United released a song. I think it was an FA Cup final song. And was it the status quo? Yeah. Come on, your Reds. Were you yeah. part of that? Oh, yeah. I was. <laughs> <laughs> now, you're a music aficionado. You're a fan. And that song itself, where does it rank amongst the great football songs? The great pantheon of football songs. I think it because it's really it's a status quo song, and that. So if you, it's, it's it's a status quo song. It's their signature. It's all their music, musical stuff. It's Rick. You know, it's it's them playing, and they're actually doing it. So they're all the playing. We just had, we just turned up to record and make a video. So it's just. It's a state school song and it, it's a formula that worked very, very well. You know, there's that old joke into it about there's somebody saying to Francis Rossi, um, you're not a bit um, annoyed when people say you're a, a three chord band. And he goes, I'm not, I'm never annoyed about that. He says, because we're actually we're only a two chord band. But they, they found a way, didn't they? And they found they a different way. They found a, a tune and found a huge amount of fans at a particular time. And I think they've got um, <clears throat> some some good songs. So it's a state school song that, that we are involved in that did very well. Was it a good laugh? Get out of the studio. Laugh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and they were good, they were good lads as well. Was, yeah, we did we had a good time. 
and as you can see in the videos, different people doing different things that would be aligned to what their personality was. So Sharpie's always been a one that likes the limelight, so he's quite that comes across prevalent in, in the video. I was hiding. I think I don't even know if I'm in the video because I was hiding most of the time. But you need to check that out. You were in Manchester at the right time when it came to music. I mean, you're drinking first, Stone Roses mug there. The whole Manchester yeah. movement. Yeah. Some cracking bands. Was that? Were you into that at the time, Brian? I was into. I, I was listening to Stone Roses before I went to Manchester. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd, that would be that CD time. So that then that that the, the, um, the car that I got had a, a CD player in it, and, and the Stone Roses album was was one of the ones that, that I would be listening to. Um, when I first went down, but yeah, but, but it was, I wasn't, I was never, um, I didn't have so many opportunities to go to the concerts because of, of football commitments. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I was never in the, I was never in the Hacienda, which, although it would have been a great experience. Uh, I think it was a lot of when I've heard people telling stories about it, potentially it might not have been a great experience, you know. So, yeah, it was great, great buzzing, all places they said, it was buzzing. Football, for me, United started doing really, really well. And the music it went along with that, was incredibly good. Mm, brilliant. See, when you, when you think back then, and you've got the Roses watching you playing football for mm. Man United, you listening to the Roses, there's this mutual appreciation. How did you get to know Manny down the line? I think we just uh, we just met up we just, uh, a mutual acquaintance, and we met up. Um, I think it was actually the first time we met him was before a primal scream game in Manchester. Before the, and we mm -hmm. sat and had a couple of beers and chatted mm -hmm. about. It. And it was like a um, mutual adoration society that got set up from that, and we remained pretty close early since that, you know. And we, it was a, uh, the, I managed to catch up with him a couple of weeks ago and have a couple of drinks and reminisce about um, about football and music and politics and several other events in each other's lives. Um, and it was it was probably more. It was pretty special because I think we've been in situations where you know we've been sitting twiddling our thumbs for a long time at home. Yeah. We've been unable to do these things, so certainly appreciate it. Certainly appreciated it when it was when we were sitting there having a drink. And then, like, because of a what a wonderful thing now about things that because the the age we're at now, it's nice to go out in the afternoon for a couple of hours. Then you you've got a finite time because you've got here to get home for the for mm -hmm. these kids, and you get straight, you know, have a couple of drinks, and there's a finite thing. There's no like, come on, let's go on to. Let's go on to this, and before you know it, you're, you, you're, you know you're talking to each other because your mouths are moving, but there is absolutely no... <laughs> no I'm not saying there was any sense anyway, but, you know, you're inebriated. So I, I, I quite like now, but this early door stuff. And stuff yeah, like or early, absolutely. Early doors, you know. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to be out now and, and watching games outside at 8 o'clock. No. Because the time the game finishes, I just want to get back. So unless it was like a short stroll from where I live, I wouldn't be... I'm that interested in that. No, I don't blame you. you know, so. And then a lot of times, you know, now we're in a situation where there's no, no volume. Sometimes that's a benefit, isn't it? But you want to. No, it's a benefit because you can do when you switch, when you're watching football until recently, there's no crowd and those daft crowd noises and uh, anodyne commentators and, um, and the re experts. Some of them are good, some of them are not. Is, you can just press mute and it's not going to make any difference to the experience. But, and I know there's different ways of just having crowd noises and all that, but by the time the game when you try and do that, I'm thinking, if I try to put that on, I'm going to miss a goal, so... And then I have to forget. Is that uh, the, the, the crowd makes a what a difference, just hearing them sing, mm -hmm. boo, uh, celebrate, sad, it, it's it's the right it is the, the appropriate time shouting at the lines but well, all those not in because uh, Clive tells him the other night because he was he went into the the little bunker that they had and the person that was in this little bunker had some like eight or nine crowd noises 
no idea at all about football and just try to, try to guess when they should be booing the decision or cheering or and if you watch through a lot of those games you know why are they doing that and it's like there's no relevance to the mm-hmm. oh when it's clearly not anywhere near the goals there was there was talking they, they always talk so you have to talk because it lasts longer than the cricket but then it was it was the it was the, the scene of the cricket it was like is that a wicket there and all and it, cause there was no thing about this is what this is what we're talking about chocolate cake that they do a lot on the Test match special too. And it's a wicket for Anderson. That same that six down now, and England looks as if they're going to to uh, go on to uh, to win the first Test against New Zealand. I know there was crowds at that one, but previous ones. And it's the same with the football, mm-hmm. just like same kind of level for them. And I think they find it difficult, you know. And also when you listen to stuff, a lot of the time that people say and all that amused me. But some of the daft things that come out, we're trying to explain things, mm-hmm. you know. So um, I was like, I was like amused that uh, uh, James McFadden wasn't it? It was doing the, the expert commentary next to the, um, the anyway. James is doing the bits he fill in about well, this and that, and he goes, well, you know, these and the commentator said that, that Scotland have been in the Euros twice and won one game. And they've got this before they scored, and they've got a chance of being them. Um, they've been in the, uh, the, the the first Scotland group to go into the next stage of a, of a, a major football competition. It's that great. We were all open that. It's looking like, that would be brilliant. That. And then he goes, yeah, and, and if they do that, this group of players could have got a chance of going down. It's the best ever Scotland team. And I'm like, hold on a minute, that's a wee bit. Forget about anything to do. I'm not nothing to do with me. I'm thinking right away. I'm thinking 1967, right? Mm-hmm. Or going even further back, you know, like Wembley Wizards even before that. That's the kind of games I'm thinking. I mean, it didn't matter what we would do. We'd have to win the competition to be comparison to yeah. that 67 team that, that that battered England after they won the World Cup. Mm-hmm. So um, sometimes it amuses me about. And another thing, the other thing was, that's not much in the England game. Right? This is a, I think it was Jimmy and Jenis, right? So, what you see and what you're listening to while I'm watching, it's the same players. One's wearing an England strip, the other one's wearing a Croatia strip. But the Croatia player, he's diving. He's diving. Try he's diving. That's cheating. Harry Kane was the captain of England. He's been cute. I see them doing exactly the same thing. Yep. What they are actually doing, that looks exactly the same. Does that look the same? But no, Harry Kane's cute. He's a diving bastard. <laughs> yeah, listen to it. And I, I don't know. mind being. I don't. I don't mind the problem with commentators being a bit more biased towards their country or their. But don't be turning around and saying. Don't be turning around for me and saying the the audience, particularly independent audience, are stupid, right? Oh, I can't see that being a foul. Well, that's definitely a foul. It's the same thing. Mm-hmm. You've got to be able to, for me, be more... Ali McCoy's probably one of the best ones of that. He's still, say, you know, I think he's fairer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I've got to say, Brian. See, he's cute. <laughs> Look at him, he's been cute. He's cheating. He's trying to get an advantage. He's cheating. Well, it's good for the goose. How is the, the haggis going? beautiful, man. Nice. I yeah. like it. Ready for another dish? That's my favourite, actually. Is that the favourite so far? There's two to no, go. No, my favourite. In a little chip shop. Oh, aye. I guess I'd have off. a debate with us all white pudding black pudding and haggis and mm. I usually pump for haggis well I'm glad you're enjoying it let's get another dish in Number four, Chalky, let's do it. Oh, oh, oh. Just, it was it dishes? What an for this piece. It's not really a dish, is it? Oh, well, it could be a digestive, I suppose. I can smell that. Oh, that smells like it's bringing back some memories. 
of a misspent youth. <laughs> <laughs> My whole life's been misspent, I think. <laughs> Just while you're, you're sampling that, I'll, I'll tell you the story about your, your friend, Pat Nevin, who similarly sampled it and quite enjoyed this beverage. Yeah, but it does taste nice, though. I'm not so sure out of a whole bottle, though underneath the slide, or the shoot, as we call it in Scotland. Mm -hmm. But yeah, as a, as a, a, a drink to have is a, yeah, it's nice, yeah. yeah. I, I can't disagree with that. The, the monks did fall upon a very good formula for, they did. for a tonic wine. It's and just unfortunate that it became a, a big problem in the, in the, in the west of Scotland, more, you know, particularly around the Buckfast Triangle. We had the coat bridge in Bell so isn't but it? It is a nice taste. It is, yeah. it is nice, and that we keep it in the fridge, Brian. <coughs> so that is yeah. chilled. Um, it's been known, or it's been referred to as electric soup, or wreck the hoose juice. Can, do you know why? Yeah, for some reason it depends. You do lally into it, so I say I've only ever had had a, I just had a, a few. My um, one of my uncles when he used to have a, he used to drink. One of his drinks to go to the pub, he'd have a half, and his half was a book, but a glass of Buckfast. Brilliant. So he would sit there with a half a lager or a half a heavy and uh, watch the racing on the telly and uh, sip his, his Buckfast. So it's a, it, it, it's a lovely taste. Um, if ingested properly. Really, yeah, well, and then I can understand if you're hammering down a bottle of it. It's a. Uh, can be a, can be like you just said there. You know, so. I've heard some kind of myths, or maybe they're true, about Buckfast and the fact that there's a number on the bottom of the bottle, and depending on the number, um, it correlates with the potency of the bottle. Higher the number, I just thought the was more of a dunt. I just thought it was all to do with the. You know, I don't think that when you look at the percentage of, all, of alcohol, it's that. I think it's a caffeine. To, is that what it is? I think it's a caffeine. And unfortunately, it's in a, a very heavy kind of glass bottle, which becomes a weapon. After a couple of bottles of the tonic, Brian McClure is drinking tonic wine at yeah, a State of Mind studio. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, it's... Uh, it is nice to... I mean, I would yeah. say it's, it is it a nice tasting drink to be saying that <laughs> there was a... A restaurant, a really nice restaurant that opened up in uh, Stockport a couple of years ago. Uh, and he was one of these, uh, well, notable chefs, a young notable chef. And then part of his, and they got a great review in the in the Sunday Times, a real, like a four or five star review in the Sunday Times, by one of these food critics. And one of his, one of his ingredients and one of his dishes was about first. Brilliant. And uh, the guy mentioned the same sort of analogy that you had said, but in whatever he made it with, it, it, it enhanced the dish that he'd, mm -hmm. he'd made with it. Mm -hmm. And the place was uh, booked out with, for, you know, he, you got what he gave you. It was not a menu per se, uh, but uh, I never managed to go. No, no, I'll have to check, see if it's still open. I know, or uh, come around the Twilight Zone. But no, that is a lovely drink. Is there a kind of porty consistency? Do you mm. think? There might be a porty taste to it. Eh? Yeah, I can see why you would you would think it was port if you hadn't tasted it before. Mm -hmm. If you've tasted it before, quite clearly you know exactly what it is. <laughs> yeah, and the exactly colour as well, you know. You looked at you know, if you wouldn't see very much you drinking out of the bottle. I wasn't I wasn't part of any of that. I was uh, I was busy at the weekend, so and I wasn't allowed out. See where the with regards to the drink in the football. I know maybe not so much these days but back in the 80s and 90s it was part of being part of a team there was a cam camaraderie there was drinking clubs um, and when you think back to your Man United days Brian did you come in at the tail end of that culture? Yeah there was there, I think there's a different there's a different thing from from say it's a culture to do um I think Alex Ferguson decided that there was a there was a group that uh, that, that weren't going to be educated, uh, and maybe also as well that 
It, it's two parts. I think maybe they were thinking that maybe there was a bit too, too much of that as an influence on other people with regards to saying, well, you need to be, you have to come out, you know, if you don't come out, you're, um, you're a pussy, you know. But apart from that, I think there was some, there was another side to it, I think, for me as well, when you, when, when you uh, analyse it in, in depth, is that Fergie was only interested in the, the number of times you were available to pull the shirt on, mm -hmm. most importantly, match day. And the number of the ones that, that that uh, were, were released around about that time, the number of ones that were involved, I would, would be say you would, you would t if you were talking about saying you would have a, a group of players and you would, you would, Gordon McQueen had already gone, but uh, Rob, Brian Robson was in that, that one with, um, with Norman Whiteside, Kevin Moran, and unfortunately Kevin was lived, lived uh, not Kevin, sorry, Paul McGrath, lived in the same kind of area as Norman, and, and uh, he had a problem. That, that people didn't realise, and that Norman was a Norman was an alcoholic. And not certain Norman. Paul was a real chronic alcoholic and mm. managed to have a wonderful football career, despite the, the, these various different episodes with drinking. Um, but again, that thing for me that was down to looking at uh, that Fergie and Archie Knox looking at a number of times they were all available mm -hmm. uh, to be able to play. And maybe this was not not helping in the sense of of why they were injured. It was a reason to you get your treatment and then go go drinking. You know, um, I was I was not involved in that one because I didn't live there geographically. And two, I was always fit, so I was never really. The thing that, that notable for later on was that. We, we used to call, we used to call him every now and again it was suggested and even we knew that the blessing would come from the manager that we needed a team meeting so when we started to win things and we got to the point where we were, we were looking as if we were certainly challenging for for league titles that there's moments where that that there was felt that you needed a clear the air situation mm -hmm. and that uh, it should be suggested we needed a team meeting which so we would be told, so but Robbo, being the captain, would have had them either whichever way the whatever way the flow was coming out from Fergie or from Robbo, that we needed a team meeting because of whatever. We would um, we would train very very hard on a Monday morning, really really hard on a Monday morning, and then we would go to the pub in the afternoon. Now, the part of the pub in the afternoon was that we all had to go. So you, 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 you all had to go unless you had some um, very, very good reason for not going. But we all had to go. And when we were there, we'd spend the first part of the day clearing the air, where it was, you were allowed to, it was a free pass verbally. So you were allowed to say whatever you wanted. And it was, as soon as that mm -hmm. session was finished, it was forgotten about. That was the idea anyway forgotten about so if you were if you had any issues with whoever to do with the football then it was you were allowed to to say what you thought well you know the question what do you think we can do better or what can we do better what can we do better and we all we, we, we slowly we slagged each other off told each other exactly what you need to tell them this is the truth what we think and you had to take it and, and absorb it and analyse it yourself and a lot of the times when you're getting that criticism and that praise and equal measures from your your um your teammates, it's usually right. So we do that a little bit, and then you're away and free because of the day off the next day to to do whatever you want to do. So mm -hmm. we were collectively together for two or three hours doing all that, and then you you know if you then that would be like some kind of signal would go up or whatever that that was finished and we could people could stay and just continue to do having a laugh and a joke. Then that bit was finished. Or you can continue on to the right through the, the night if you wanted to, mm -hmm. and that and that, that worked. Well, good. So and then Wednesday we came back into it and we were we were all right back at it. There was no little, there was no kind of atmosphere around the, the dressing room or on the. Ah, it worked mm -hmm. really well. No, that that would have that would have worked if you were able to get a group of players into a room and sat there and yeah. but the the but that just that little uh, that little bit of lager. Gave you the courage to just 
just lifted a wee bit of any and ambitions that people might have because everybody mm -hmm. at different uh, what at different ages, you know. So you, you're really young ones, and you know, you'd get, you'd get involved in that with uh, schools and but, and then you'd older ones that right by then with myself and Bruce and Robo, and then a mixture in between. And we wanted them to say because we we felt that. That it should perpetuate. I don't know if it did after you know, when I left, but mm -hmm. we felt that this was a good thing to be able to do. And if they were confident at 19 to be able to turn around and tell Rob they thought it was shit, then then hopefully they would they would be able to take that through and and um, and uh, help anybody who either came through the the um, youth system that they did or anybody else that came into the club to say that no, this is the standards and the traditions. And the ethics of, of what Manchester United was all about. So See, the alcohol you, was the alcohol was useful. It was yeah, used, those. yeah, it was used yeah. effectively. Yeah. See, I mean, some of the names, but schools that generation coming through. Brian, was there any within that? Because I, I you know, I think Nicky, but sometimes gets a, he, he doesn't get forgotten about, but he doesn't get the limelight of a David Beckham or you know that type of player. Do you think he was? As good as at a certain level. Look, for Nicky Butt to get a game before me just tells you how good a player he was. <laughs> <laughs> Nicky was the first one to get in the team. Mm -hmm. You know, so he was, he he was, was hard, the, wasn't he? he hard player. Still is. Yep. He he was the first one really to be in the team. So, yeah, I think the players like like Nicky are always overshadowed for what they do because mm -hmm. it did it, because it's a more of a. <laughs> It's not, it's not glamorous, you know. Him and um, him and Gary were probably the ones that, as you say, were just got on and did their job. Yeah. And without a lot of fuss. I mean, schools is the same kind of thing. Although uh, schools he got on his job without any fuss, but because schools had made more uh, attacking chances, he scored more goals. Mm -hmm. He's going to get more of a um, more of whatever it is that's going around. Um, but there were, but, but yeah, perhaps Nicky didn't, 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 didn't but, but the thing is with that what was appreciation is the only one it was only important and the and the loyalty is only important, important for one thing is that Alex Ferguson trusted them mm -hmm. and that was all I'm mad so he trusted you you got to play and he played United for long enough to accrue um, a Worcester medals yeah and you until said such points that Alex Ferguson felt that mm -hmm. Whatever else I can say, that I can't answer what it was. I mean, it's easy enough for me with more mortality because I was 34, 33, 30, whatever. You know, 39, whatever, whatever, 39, whatever, there's a more mm -hmm. different thing. And uh, and he was, he was, he always, he just decided that's how, how he kind of evolved, you know, all of a sudden mm -hmm. you were playing in the big games, and next game you're playing the League Cup games. And somebody else was playing the big games, and that would have happened to all of them as they, they travelled that journey through. But uh, all good players all played for their countries. If it wasn't for me, they would never have been players. I was playing with them. I was participating with them in the reserves before. Mm -hmm. that, and uh, I knew what they were capable of. And just training with them during the day. And also um, playing the games. So I, I knew what they were, they were like, you know. But, um and in the, in the, in the, if I say that anything about it, that uh, at the beginning, at the early stages, uh, because of just how, what he did in training, I tried to do in training, I, I couldn't see David being a player. Mm -hmm. I couldn't see, yeah, he just wanted to see me hit a, a world 40, 50 yard pass. The Hollywood time. pass. This was even indoors sometimes. And I kept thinking, what are you, what are you doing, you know? It's like, but he, uh, he, he worked hard at his game and found a, a, um, a diversification. Uh, they found a, a way of, of playing mm -hmm. and playing to within it, to their strengths within some wonderful teams. And I think him and Gary together had a wonderful, I mean, really good, really, really good friends. And I think they worked really well. And Gary worked really, really hard at, at perfecting the 10-yard pass and got really good at it. Mm -hmm. And then the 10-yard pass really basically was pass it into to Kino or pass it out to David and then run past him and he did and Andy's long throw which Gary Parsley got a hairdryer about once because he didn't know then that Gaz had a long throw see when you strange things in that but from the outside looking in you, you build a perception of Roy Keane or Eric Cantona yeah. Roy Keane being the steely hard man in the middle of 
midfield, abrasive, Cantona being a philosopher, an artist, an entertainer. What are they really like, Brian? Because you shared changing rooms and training pitches with these guys. You know, the, part of the thing that, that's always going to be an advantage is that you trusted the manager to bring people in that he knew a lot about. Mm -hmm. So when they came into the, the dressing room, so when Eric comes to Manchester United and he's got an opinion probably well-deserved as a, an own font terrible, a naughty boy, right? That, that's what he comes to the club with. Mm -hmm. We'd played against them. I'd seen him playing for France against Scotland and when he came in Paris when it was absolutely lashing down. And they, they, they battered us 3-0, proper battering. And uh, he was, Canton, I was magnificent. All the French players were wearing moulded molded boots over there like you got in that. And it was like, uh, Stevie, Lowe, which we'd be wearing as training boots, mm -hmm. hard ground boots. It was absolute torrential rain. And every single one of those players went out onto that field as for, for France with moulded boots, what we call them, or so hard ground boots. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I mean, fuck, he's a bit on their arse all the time. Just skated around the place. Roy Keane's, without, Roy Keane, sorry, Roy Aitken's studs, without exaggerating, or that size. They just, yep. It's one of the, he's just like, oh my God, please don't put me on. And uh, so you trusted the manager. So when he, when he came in, Roy was great. Eric, Eric, first of all, Eric first of all, was great. He, he wanted to, do, he was polite. He, he knew who we all were. He, and, he, and he loved, he just knew that he loved being there. And as soon as he started playing, he loved it. Mm -hmm. And the punters loved him and they were for great. Uh, Bromance was born between Manchester United supporters and, and then Eric Cantona that still exists to this day. And he was, he was a really good player. Worked hard. Worked hard. There was no problem. He never kicked any us. <laughs> he was great. Yeah. And even those things you're involved in, it's, it's, it's good to be able to have stories to tell about those situations, you know, that you, I'm not, you have always got upset and annoyed with your teammates of the opposition and people at the sideline. But it's never ever occurred to me to launch myself <laughs> at somebody, you know. And yeah, it did that because of whatever, you know. And he had these different little things, whether it was really believed or not, that was part of his personality, the painting. It was painted by numbers, but it was still painting enough and beautiful. It was a, it a beautiful uh, field of, um, of of growing uh, hay or not hay, whatever it's called, barley. A beautiful barley. It looks like a, it looks like a, it looks like a money picture where he's standing in this field and he turns it round and it's painting by numbers. It's these splashes of, and he gets away because he's Eric Cantona. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> But, he, but again, he worked really, really hard to get to that, and he went through loads of shit. You know, he didn't. He wasn't just fighting with his teammates for no reason. He was fighting with them because he believed in certain things, in principle. And he was very principled. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. very principled. And he, he was good. He was funny. If you got to find a way of whatever, he just sat there and he'd take it in, but he would laugh at things he was doing and all that. He'd laugh away. Uh, and. He always bought his own to drink, albeit with a platinum American Express card. But he still, he still bought his drinks. And, of course, he was managed really well by Alex Ferguson, wasn't he? I think you can look at that with everyone. That, that when, you, when you look at situations that what Alex Ferguson was a wonderful man manager. Mm -hmm. um, he could... Uh, People talk and they'll continue to say the same thing. That, and you, you'll probably hear it during the Euros, depending on the results for different teams and how long a, a coach or a manager has been in the, in the national. That, uh, and you've heard it last year with sure the certainty people have said that's it, uh, Lenny's got to go, he's lost the dressing room. Alex Ferguson lost the dressing room after every single game on a Saturday, from all the way through from East Ireland, all the way through Manchester United and Scotland, he's lost the dressing room. By Monday afternoon, you were ready to go to war for him again. Mm -hmm. Now that's how you managed it. But that's it, we're all finished, that's it, I'm never playing for him again. Who does he think he is? To some people going in and actually going to tell him that, to 
you know, uh, so wonderful pavement psychology, incredible. Mm. And, he, and he adapted and developed as he went through having to deal with different, having to deal with, um, uh, he's different having to deal with at the time when he when he starts off at, at Manchester United, having to to, uh, to manage um, Remy Moses as it is when he's going to manage Ronaldo. Mm-hmm. But he took the care to find out how it was that he could be able to work out what their needs were and what they expected of him, and that that developed through. So I say that uh, he um, he calmed down. I don't know what he was before, but he calmed down to a madman. <laughs> that was my take on it. Super by the time yeah. he was retiring, you know, because yeah. whatever he was before, that was when I first a few time, levels above, way beyond. Uh, yeah. From, so yeah, incredible man manager. Final dish, you ready? Oh. You can finish that. Oh, hopefully, I can't waste it. I can't waste drinks. Final dish, you ready for this one, Brian? We've had a wee bit of everything. This is a final dish. Uh, I've only ever had one of these before. Why are in? I've only had one. One? And that was when I was doing a bit for uh, a bit of filming in Glasgow. Oh, yeah, right, there we go. What do you think it is about Scotland? Well, I, mean, I say to people that. Uh, you get deep fried pizza. <laughs> you just mentioned with cows even. Deep fried pizza and you just fold it over, put it in a bar and that didn't seem normal to me. Mm. You know, but they were normal deep fried haggard. And they didn't seem normal and because you go into the chip shop and you see things that Roddy made. And then and you can't get I, I prefer um special fish. Mm-hmm. You can't get that in England. Right? It's not even any concept of it. Far from any ones I've been in. So when you talk about like deep fried pizza or that, I try to work out the first of all how you get a pizza. <laughs> just thinking about, does the topping not just all fall off? <laughs> <laughs> so you're like, well, they fold it over and then they put it in the bar and then straight into the thing and it's all kind of sealed. And it's just that kind of crunch and all that kind of... Oh, that's, you're and selling and it. This you're person selling here is a bit of genius, isn't it? it is a, so much it so is. that... I was almost tempted to buy it first time I saw it actually on sale, but the establishment wasn't open, and it was in Singapore. Is that right? Wow, it's better than I thought it would be. It right. tastes like something I would I would have that ice cream, chocolate. Yeah, it does taste better than it does. Yeah, yeah. Well, that was I would say it was only a couple of years after I tried it. I thought I'm not really. A, is that a Mars bar? I'm not really a fan of Mars bars. Anyway. A deep fried picnic now. Or a deep fried you toffee crisp. That. Toffee crisp, yes. You can go in now, can't you? Mm-hmm. For Anything you want. Some chip shops. Which you would, wouldn't you? Because you're making money out of them. Particularly in the difficulties we've had. Would you fry that up for maybe not 50 pence or a pound? I don't know what they charge. Oh, you would. I really like it. I always have it with I might try it off with crisp. You'd have it with ice cream or oh, whatever else. As a so, pudding. As, as a whatever else it was, it was a mistake or whatever way it happened, it's pretty genius. Yeah, it works. In the sense of, well, if I'm just off in one place, if you're looking for a global sort of mm-hmm. identity with something, it's always going to be Scotland, isn't it? In this place, and it wasn't not a chip in, in Singapore, it was a restaurant, right? And a lovely little row of restaurants around a very beautiful part of Singapore, and it was beautiful in them. But and uh, it was, I was like, I took a picture of it, I don't know, I may have it somewhere, I've got it somewhere. I don't know. 
Yeah, oysters. Mussels. Oh, that's a beautiful fish. What? Deep fried Mars bar. And it was, and it was a speciality. Mm -hmm. now, these were special dishes. Oysters. I must ask me whether or not got special orders. Deep fried Mars bar. Look at that. It's a delicacy. Yeah, you look at that. I go, you know. It's no English dishes on this thing. It's a. <laughs> somebody, you know, somebody's, it wasn't a Scottish fish, I know. It was just wonderful. That's incredible. Whiskey. Deep fried Mars bars. Superb. Go in the world. Iron brew. Iron brew, yes. And Buckfast, although not Scottish, certainly associated with areas of Scotland. Synonymous, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Now, talk to me about your podcast, Brian. I remember speaking mm. to you probably a couple of years ago now, so it was no surprise to me that you had a podcast. Surprise to me? Complete surprise to me. Is it? Yeah, I don't like talking to people. I don't like talking to people unless they ask me, but <laughs> as you go back to talking about, you know, the words... If you see, so, so Pat, we talk about Pat and Evan again, and uh, Pat's view of words is that he would rather use several paragraphs. What did I try to do now? I would, I would rather try to get down to one letter. Mm -hmm. So sometimes I'll be messaging people, text messages on a WhatsApp message, I just write one letter, which I think is good. Sometimes I've no idea what I mean, but... And emojis, ah, emojis are... Amazing Wrong. things, yeah. wonderful. Not always. Yeah. You can take the sting out of what you're saying as well. Not always be construed the same <laughs> exactly the way you might have thought it to be, but pictures or whatever else is. Um, so that I've always enjoyed. I've always enjoyed since I was asked going back to um, ninety, I think, to do this diary thing, and it allowed me to. Um, well, I'd say they're difficult to went to pre season South Africa. When you start, I was always doing this anyway, observing what people are doing and laughing at them. Same thing, I'm laughing at James McFadden. Is that I'm not laughing at Bruce and I'm laughing at Robo and I'm laughing at people's interactions and like different sets of scenarios, you know, and you know what Sparky was like when he was, he was just uh, when he was uh, sitting at dinner. What Sparky was like after he's had a couple of beers and that. And I, people, and I was like watching and sometimes it, I just like to be entertained I just wanted to have a laugh every day or often in my life I just wanted to have a laugh every day and just the joy of laughing and, and seeing something that's funny still so have the same view so when they asked me to do this thing I thought well it would be just a bit boring I don't know if it's just it's going to be boring if, like, it's boring you know that's why I mean that this, I used to give those answers out to those to those things that uh, in the shoot and the match and all that that Mark who does a podcast did programmes about right. he did podcasts about mm -hmm. I did it Pat did it John Cowan did it about revisiting did you revisit these questions from the and the and great it was a wonderful podcast so it was different things about the diary so I did the diary I was a player I left, I left and then I came back as a coach and I came back as a coach so they asked me to do it and I was kind of read the different formats and it's funny the, the things that developed it's like, so sometimes I used to make stories up if I was a bit lost up for stuff and then when I started doing it as a coach, the players used to come and tell me. They would be telling me. They're real, let's share this one about me. Like, what's share this one? Sometimes get me into trouble with Fergie as well, but... Sometimes, so we've got that kind of thing. So do that, and then I've stopped when, the, when David Moyes came, because I knew what it was like. And I, you can't have someone on the inside like me being trivial and whimsical about things that might be true and might be not because it can be screwed in various different ways having been in the newspapers several times over stuff things that I've written right so I stopped it because I wanted them to be no distractions from a member of the staff writing all this stuff that could be construed in any way that the press decide in any form that the sort of media decide because there's several different things the media now stopped it and then decided that I would, I would take up again when the uh, and uh, a friend of mine, Matthew, who's a bit of a writer, said, well, I don't just do a bit of that. It's, I'll do it just as a, out there, you just put it out. And if someday any one person finds it and they find it interesting or amusing, because that's what it's about, distracting. Mm -hmm. Great. And then he said, well, what would you do with a podcast? Like, I don't want a podcast for I don't want to talk to anybody else. for thought, yeah, I'll do it. Well, let's try it, you know. If we could get on. And then right away you think, you think about people you know, don't you? So it's like... 
you ask people you know mm -hmm. and uh, it was and I, I wanted to be the same way without being condescending more so because of the climate we've been living through that uh, there's an awful lot of people suffering in various different ways I don't want it to be anything that's just say to me that I'm just ignoring everything that's happening out here just for the sake of a laugh it had to be something that was relevant to to that part of people's lives and what they're doing and can really say whatever they want. And I think it's a good thing about it is you can just say whatever you like and you can put it out there and people can like it or not. And that, that's fine. Mine's is about the idea of a friend of mine who lost his job, Brian lost his job before Christmas, uh, was that he's he's wandering around the day. And it's a distraction from that period of time where he's, where he's collecting his thoughts about what's he going to be doing next. Mm -hmm. You know, he still wants to have a job. He's not young enough to retire. And, he, and it distracted him. I just wanted to be a distraction. So for that 45 minutes an hour, it was distracting him from life, reality, and all that shit was going on. And then for me, that was uh, when he said, oh, that was great, I enjoyed that. And my brother saying, that was shit. Ah, I like that. It's because it's, that's part of the way it should be, you know? Uh, so... And then if, if for some strange reason you people proffering to go, oh, yeah, because of sometimes of something what you did. I don't, I don't do things because of I'm thinking, can I get out of this? Or is there some kind of benefit? What's, what's in it for me? And an awful lot of people like that. An awful lot of people maybe in my experience because I was in football, they like that. A lot of people is about players, about what can I get more of this, more of this, more mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really interested in, in that. It's more about, well, can you do something that, that might be nice or something to somebody? So there's loads of things. I've had loads of messages for people. Some people that, that I know have asked me to do messages for them, a lot of videos. For people who have been poorly, people whose birthdays it are, people's anniversaries. And you get quite a good reaction to that. Mm -hmm. I just do that because people ask me. There's now people who have set up businesses, but more, more uh, particularly during lockdown. Yeah. And they're charging people. I, mean, I feel embarrassed to think about somebody saying, because I, mean, I was doing it anyway, I just, I just people so I really appreciate it, but you know, it's my uncle, my dad, my brother, my sister, daughter, and I just think it's, um, it takes me seconds to, well, it doesn't all take me seconds how to work out, it's the thing, it takes me seconds to record it, because I found out on Instagram that it was not my thing, and I realised this, that because I've got a message on Instagram, I took the video on through the Instagram app and sent it to the guy, and the guy deleted it, or a like that because that's what they do don't they just disappear got a time limit on them so then I'm going to try and work out so then he, he wants to get it he wants to wants, can he send it by email well I've only got one email address I'm going to have, I've got to create another email address because you know because what you find is it, it, people are really really interested in lots of collecting stuff if you give them a postal address yeah. mm -hmm. before you know it you start getting it's like it's like having um, it's like having an owl Harry Potter, have your own owl. Please sign these 25 prints, but You just, I know it's okay, yeah. it's, but I've, one person said, if one person says to me, that you want it, but it ends up that I just, this owl keeps delivering these pictures, I, it's all, I do sign it sent back. It's just, it's so, I think about it, I don't know about those terms, but I just wanted it to be uh, enjoyable. People seem to enjoy it. I quite enjoy finding out about people that mm -hmm. I don't really know to ask, try and get, doing some things. I want to find some, you've got a, a brilliant little hook here, a little brilliant little theme that, that coaxes out maybe an odd story here and there that hopefully will be something they'll find interesting. So you hear something that you think, oh, that was brilliant, that, you know, like somebody comes out with something like, oh, that's, you know, because I don't know why it is. A lot of people, some people do like talking. Something and I quite like the research as well, you know. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. spending a little bit of time, just what can I ask them? You know, what, what the reply might be. And some of the things are like that's, that's wonderful. So long may it continue. Continue to do them yeah. as long as my mate's got a job now, so I don't know if he wants to listen to them anymore. Unless he's got to go in the car, I'm not going to ask him if he's got to travel. This is the thing. So I might have inspired them, you know. Walk so the if that's dog. it, if I've inspired somebody to get a job then I'll, I'll, it's been well worth well worth it so I would recommend it and we'll put a link underneath the video as well Brian how have you enjoyed your tart and taste buds experience oh well as I say I think you've got a, it's it, it, part of the thing going through this what you've just done there is almost as if a bit like that question and you should never revisit it you should never look to that let's just see what I wrote in those 
going back 30 years ago, one of the right in the shoot, favourite food, favourite drink, mm. favourite whatever else it is. But as, a, as an effort, as a, a tasting platter of platters, yeah, you've you've done very well. Yeah, it's a a very very good mix you've got, and I like the idea that you've you've presented the, the deep fried confectionery as a dessert, which probably is rather than anything else. Take that with you, or I'll finish it off. Brian McClear, thanks for joining us on Tartan Taste Buds. Mm-hmm.